Um, well, hi, everybody. Uh, I know I already introduced myself, but again, my name is Taylor Gans. Um, going to be presenting today on some of the topics from my dissertation. Um, but I just want to point out that a whole lot of people contributed to this work, um, especially my research advisor, Dr. Laura Peru, and also Dr. Malia DeVito at the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, and again, thank you so much for inviting me to share this research. Okay. Thanks to you. I'm not sure what happened there. No worries. Okay, I think we're good. So the big focus of my part of this broad Washington predator prey project was really to look at the ungulate populations and try and understand how these many factors, including wolves, other predators, forage dynamics, um, and humans, influence their survival, population dynamics, and movement. So we had two primary study areas for the Washington Predator Prey Project, and we looked at predators across both of those study areas. You can see them highlighted there in green. And in that north central study area, we really focused um, from the ungulate perspective on looking at mule deer. Um, and I really looked at their movement in response to predators and wildfires. Um, while there were white-tailed deer in this area, we didn't really focus on them for the project. In our northeastern study area, highlighted there in purple, we looked at white-tailed deer and elk. And for both of them, I was focused more on the population dynamics. My understanding is that is what you're most interested in. So that's what I'm going to focus on today. And I'll really be focusing most on the white-tailed deer. But I'll also wrap up with a little bit um, about elk for you all. Um, there were mule deer in that northeastern study area as well, but for those familiar with it, you'll know that they're relatively rare compared, compared to the white-tailed deer, uh, so we weren't tracking them as part of the study. So the main data source that I was using for my investigations was these tracking collars that we fit on animals. Um, there's a number of key pieces of information we can get from this process. So the first is these GPS collars record locations every four hours. So we understand which locations these animals were using. And from that, we can learn something about the habitat that they're using at those sites. The second key piece of information we get is reproductive rates. Um, and there's two ways we get this. One is when we collar those animals, we're targeting adult females and we can get information on if they're pregnant. And then we can also use those locations from the collars to go target those fawns or calves for capture, which is an important part of population dynamics. And then the third really key uh, piece of information that we get by deploying these collars um, is information on survival and causes of death. Um, I or someone at DFW gets a text message when one of these collars stops moving. We investigate as quickly as we can and gather some key information at that site, um, looking at the overall scene, the evidence that we see, and predator genetic information if relevant. And from that, we can figure out how long this animal lived and hopefully um, what the cause of mortality was for that individual. So those are the three primary data sources that I use in my investigation. Okay, so let's talk about white-tailed deer population dynamics um, just in that Northeastern Washington study area. So, Part of the predator prey project is really interested in untangling these very complex food webs that we have. And we need to look at um, all the primary parts of it to understand what's driving uh, the white-tailed deer population. So one thing of course of interest to everyone here is the predators in this system. Not only are there wolves, but there are cougars, uh, bears, bobcats, and coyotes, all of which can kill, kill deer. Um, but importantly, these predators themselves may be interacting. So we need to consider how those dynamics ultimately trickle down and influence the ungulate population. Uh, and I think that's something Aaron's going to talk about a little bit more next. The other big piece to consider is what food is out there for these deer and elk. And the amount of food that's available ultimately dictates how many deer can be out there on the landscape. One of the things that's really interesting, I think, about our study is that we have a heavy human influence on the landscape, and that can influence deer through multiple pathways. So one, humans kill deer by hunting uh, and vehicle collisions. 
but humans can also change the behavior of predators, which may impact deer. And then humans um, influence the landscape as well. So within this study area in Northeastern Washington, about a quarter of the forested area has been harvested for timber in the last 20 years. And we did habitat surveys across the area and found that those recently harvested areas had a 55% increase in forage violence. Um, agriculture as well can influence the forage that's out there for deer. So human impacts are coming from both directions. So we had a couple of research questions that we really wanted to focus on um, for this project. First, what is the growth rate of the white-tailed deer population? Second, what are the primary causes of mortality for those deer that we tracked? How does predation influence population growth? How does forage biomass influence population growth? And then how do humans play into these dynamics? So what you can see on the left there is um, our study area. Uh, the blue locations are the GPS locations of our collared deer. Those are overlaid um, in red on wolf pack territories. And I'm just showing 2019 territories here to keep it simple. We collared 131 adult female deer. We estimated that survival uh, was 73% based on those um, collars we deployed. Pregnancy rates were high at 96%. On an average, there was 1.6 fawns per adult female. We collared 150 fawns and estimated uh, annual survival at 36%. And then we investigated 118 mortalities, 46 from adult females, the rest from fawns. So what were those mortalities due to? Um, what I want you to see here, first of all, there's a lot going on and it looks like things got a little jumbled, my apologies. Um, in blue are what we could confirm as the cause of death for that deer. Um, in the cases where predators are concerned, we rely on hemorrhaged bite wounds to confirm predation. Now, often if the carcass has mostly been consumed, we're not going to find those. So we additionally classified um, mortalities that we couldn't confirm, but we thought it was possible. So those are shown in gray. Uh, again, apologies for the jumbling of things here. Um, but for both adult females and fawns, you'll see that vehicle collisions contributed a substantial amount of mortality. No surprise to those of us who have spent time out in Northeast Washington. Uh, however, when we think about predators, it was pretty different for the adult females versus the fawns. Cougars were overwhelmingly the dominant predator of adult females. Uh, where fawns died from a variety of predators. Uh, you have probably noticed that there was a conspicuous lack of wolf predations. Um, we, we did have some evidence. We found some wolf DNA on site. Now we know from diet investigations in this study that Aaron's gonna talk about that wolves are definitely killing deer in this system. I think what's going on though, is that some of these unknowns may have been wolves, um, a wolf pack can very quickly consume a deer carcass, and we may not be able to find those hemorrhage bite wounds that we rely on by the time we get there. So what that means, though, is if I just looked at the population by understanding what these primary causes of mortality were, we might be biased or have an inaccurate picture. So I took a different approach to looking at the factors that were influencing the population using that GPS collar data. So we have our collared deer. We know if it lived within a year or if it died, how long it was till it died. And then we have information on the locations of that deer um, and the habitat it was using. So we created models um, where we looked at survival and how it was influenced by exposure to wolves, cougars, bobcats, coyotes, timber harvest and agriculture, which impact forage, um, distance to roads and winter severity. And we created seasonal models for fawns and adult females. So how did we do this? So we used um, GPS data from the collared wolves and cougars in the system. And basically what Sarah did, uh, that was the work Beth just presented, um, she mapped intensity of use of these predators across the study area. And so with the GPS location data of the deer, we could basically quantify, did this individual deer live in a very wolfy area or a low wolf area to other deer? So that's how we were able to create these survival equations. The other key piece of information we have is reproduction. And by putting this information together, we can then understand um, what the population growth rate is, 
as a factor of uh, survival, pregnancy rate, and the number of bonds. And then because we have these relationships between survival and exposure to wolves or cougars and forage, we can play around with tweaking what would happen to the population overall if, say, wolf numbers were in to increase or decrease, or if deer were to experience more severe winters. So before we get into those changes, let's just look at population growth overall. So we did 10,000 um, simulations of population growth. The reason they're not all the same is we account for that variation and uncertainty in the vital rates like survival and reproduction. We found that mean population growth was 0.97. A stable population is one. So it's a little bit less than what we would expect a stable population, but our confidence intervals very well overlap that stable population. They go from 0.88 to 105. I will note though that about three quarters of our simulations indicated that the population was slightly declining and a quarter of the simulations indicated that the population was increasing. Okay, so now if we look at the factors governing population growth, uh, we did find evidence that forage was limiting this population. Specifically, um, areas of recent timber harvest and agriculture are associated with more forage biomass. Deer using those areas more um, were at lower risk of mortality. And then if we simulated increases in deer use of timber harvest and agriculture, we saw an increase in population growth. And you can see that here. So horizontally, um, you see from left to right, increasing use of timber harvest, harvest or agriculture and vertically population growth. So you're seeing if timber harvest or agriculture increases, uh, the population would increase. Okay, so predators. We also found evidence of predator effects here. So deer with more exposure to cougars and wolves have higher risk of mortality and simulated increases in cougars and wolves reduced population growth. So you can see um, across the bottom, that would be increasing cougar and wolf populations. And then again, over on the uh, vertical axis is population growth of deer would decrease with increasing predators. We saw that cougar effects were three times stronger than wolves. So why would that be? I think there's two primary reasons that could explain that. One, there's more cougars and wolves in the system. And we also saw that cougars were a uh, primary source of mortality for the adult females. Um, second, wolves tend to avoid humans more than cougars do. So that might create refuge space for deer if they're hanging out near humans and using that uh, as a shield from wolves. I'll also note that bobcats and coyotes really didn't have much of an effect at all on population growth, even though they were predators of fawns in the system. Okay, so a couple key takeaways from these population simulations. Um, increased forage could uh, increase the deer population, but nutrition is really complex and we only looked at really coarse proxies here, um, just two land classification types that we know were associated with forage biomass. And there's a lot of other things going on in these landscapes. Um, however, other research has shown that um, increasing timber harvest has supported growing white-tailed deer populations elsewhere. Uh, so this fits what, with what we know about um, ungulate population dynamics. Okay, uh, predators. So based on our models, it's possible that a reduction in top predators um, may increase the deer population in the short term. But as there are more deer, there's going to be the same amount of food available and that forage effect would probably take over and become more limiting. So that's density dependent dynamics. Um, it's unclear if uh, changing, um, sorry, one thing I wanna point out to about the above point is that in areas where they have um, studied this previously, those effects tend to be pretty short-lived where predator control has happened. Okay, it's unclear though if changing regulations around predator harvest would impact deer. Uh, one, predator harvest doesn't necessarily change predator density abundance if a vacant territory is then moved into another, um, by another predator from an outside area. And uh, predator harvest has the potential to destabilize social dynamics 
Um, and so it may not result in differences in kill rates of ungulates. Okay, I'm gonna get, leave you with a little bit on the elk population dynamics here and then um, wrap up. So this is the same uh, map you saw before, but now the blue locations are the elk that we collared in the study area. Again, the reddish areas are the wolf packs in 2019. You'll see that we had nice coverage. We collared 63 adult female elk, um, an estimated annual survival about 92%. Uh, pregnancy rates were 89%. Um, and with elk, you really only have one calf per pregnancy. We collared 30 elk calves, an estimated annual survival at 63%. And then we investigated 30 mortalities, about half from adult females and about half from the calves. We did a similar stage structured population model. Um, and we actually found out that the population of elk was growing by about 10% in the study area. Um, and in this population and with uh, most ungulate populations, the population was most sensitive to the survival of adult females. So what drives mortality in adult females? Uh, we found that it was overwhelmingly due to human causes. Um, I believe that uh, three of these were due to vehicle collisions and um, the remainder were due to harvest, but the population is growing. Um, whereas calf mortality is due to a more wide array of causes, including predators. Uh, and with that, thank you so much for your time. 